Hi, I'm Stephen Downs. It's a pleasure to be able to talk to you today. If you're wondering where I am, I'm on a small country lane in Prince Edward Island. And this is almost literally the middle of nowhere. As you can see, we've got trees, we have bushes, flowers, birds, butterflies, insects that sting you and all of the rest. It's way out in the country. And the reason why I'm giving you this talk from way out here is because I want to reflect on the actual practice of using technology to support learning. And that's what I'm doing here. I'm actually using technology to support learning wherever I may happen to be. I'm speaking into a microphone, but the microphone is not attached to the camera. The microphone is attached to my MP3 player and mobile phone. Now I'm recording this just as a backup. I'd like to be podcasting it, but this is an Android phone and I haven't figured out how to podcast this yet. But if I had an iPhone, I could, and the Android technology is probably just a few years away, maybe even a few months away. So I could be talking to anyone in the world right now, live, online, audio for sure, maybe video as well and reflecting on my practical experience in the field. Well, what might that experience be? Well, it could be anything. It could be repairing roads. It could be looking at the flowers, working with the flowers that are out here. It could be technological work, etc. Now, you think about what's needed for this, and of course, you know, because it sounds really simple, you know, you just need a camera, a phone, and all of that, but you need an entire infrastructure. As I'm out here, I was just on the telephone to uh, some very nice people from the Australian Embassy in Washington. But, you know, when I do something like that, my first concern is power. And I need to have my power working. Um, same with my camera, I need to have power. But I also need connectivity. And you might wonder, well, why I have chosen to do this presentation in the middle of nowhere here. But if we look around and look at where I am, behind me is that ubiquitous symbol of progress in the Western world. Yes, it's a cell phone tower. And that's why I'm here. I'm camping about oh, 20 kilometers that way. And because I'm camping, I'm down by the, uh, down by the sea coast, but I get zero bars at my campsite. So I've come up here. And so we need not just the power, we need the internet connectivity as well. But you know, we're working in ourselves into an era where these two things, power and connectivity, are ubiquitous. And what that means is that I'm not going to have to always be worrying about my power levels on my phone. My phone will charge itself either through solar panels or just by the movements I make with it or by ambient power generation, perhaps from orbital stations or whatever. Similarly, this is, you know, again, the middle of the country in Prince Edward Island and yet I'm right next to uh, a cell phone tower Obviously, we're beginning to enter a world in which internet connection is ubiquitous. This really takes practice to the next level and it leads us to a future of online learning where we're moving from the computer into the community. And it's really hard to overstate the importance of that. It's hard to overstate the importance of that because it takes online learning outside of the home, outside of the classroom, and puts it right into the place where I'm working. Suppose, for example, and I'll just put my phone in my pocket. <laughs> Suppose, for example, I'm a botanist. Well, and I want to identify a disease in the field. What I do is I work with my camera and with my phone, and I act and I actually look right at the flowers I want to study, hopefully without too much of an incident. So here's a flower that I want to study and I want to show it to you. And uh, this, if you're not familiar with it, is called Queen Anne's Lace. 
and I can show the images of that back to the laboratory or to my students, wherever they may be in the world. I can talk about Queen Anne's lace. Here it is. Uh, I can uh, identify the bugs that might be crawling on it, the diseases it might have, because, you know, this might be, uh, say, a food crop. If it was a food crop, we'd be feeding the world with these, uh, and the rest of it. So, the actual practice can be taken into the field. Now, the next step of that is the conversion of learning as something that is set up and done uh, as a special occasion, if you will, um, into learning that is created and practiced as a part of the work that you're actually doing. You see, what you need to picture is that as I'm standing here by these trees, by these forests and that, I'm an actual person actually doing my job. Perhaps I'm an auto mechanic and I might be working on a car and maybe I'll open up the car engine. I'm not going to do it here because it'll get a little confusing. But, you know, I can open up the car engine, show how the car works. And I just do that. Anytime I fix a Chevy, I just, I'm recording it. You know, maybe I have a recording, a little recording thing in my glasses, like the Google Glass technology. The idea here is doing your job, whatever it is, also becomes teaching other people how to do your job. The two activities become one and the same. And you don't even think about it. You don't even work on, you know, I'm going to present this, I'm going to present that. You just go in, do what you do, and then that creates a model for other people to follow. And we have piles uh, piles, a nice technical word, gigabytes, there's a more technical word, of video of people repairing a Chevy, gigabytes of people uh, diagnosing problems with a flower, gigabytes of people saying, look at all the, the goldenrod in my field, what am I going to do about that? And from this, we've created this huge base of raw materials that we can now use as inputs into learning systems that help people who are interested in this. Okay, so I've got the, the practice, I've got my technology out here in the field, uh, which may be the middle of nowhere, maybe the middle of a city, uh, and now I'm working, I'm doing my job, and teaching about my job has become a part of this practice on a regular basis. What's the next step? Well, the next step is the creation of community. The next step is the idea that this is how I'm communicating with other people. There's, um, give you an example of this. There's a group called the Internet Time Alliance. Uh, it was started by Jay Cross. People in it include Jane Hart, uh, Harold Jarkey, Clark Quinn, and some others. And they're, they're all around the world. And they work in consulting for corporate learning. And the way they work is they're connected with Skype. And the Skype window is just open whenever they're working. They sit down, they work, Skype goes open. And so they're working and communicating with each other at the same time. Now, I, can, I haven't actually sat in and listened to their conversations. You know, I, I can imagine they're pretty boring most of the time. Um, I can imagine there's a lot of silence. But at the same time, you know, somebody has a thought, somebody has a question, other people are right there. This is real-time communication that's happening. We've already seen the same sort of thing happen in the educational community with technologies like Twitter, where Twitter is just on, you know, they start up the computer and they just have Twitter on. And they have their set of Twitter friends that they connect with and they're just doing their work, whatever it may happen to be, but they just have this open conversation using Twitter. I'm not really a big Twitter person, I'm not really a big Skype person, but I get this idea of working openly. Uh, working openly allows you to be part of a community. I work openly through my website, through my email newsletter, 
uh, our open online courses are examples of us teaching openly. Open online courses are just simply taking the practice of teaching in a classroom and turning on the cameras, if you will, so that anyone in the world can follow along. But again, every time you do that, you end up with this community. And this community, it's a very loose-knit, very open uh, collection of individuals from anywhere in the world. And it just forms when they start talking back and forth to each other using whatever technology that they have. So you can see the progression here that we have. Uh, you can see the progression from having the technology, the power, and the connectivity, the video, and the audio that allows us to communicate from wherever we may happen to be. Having this technology, and secondly, the next part of the progression is using this technology as part of practice, this recording of practice, the doing of things in the public sphere. And then third, the result of that is the community that forms around any subject area, any domain. We can imagine an educational environment in the future where people who are working in, say, astronomies and students of astronomy are all in the same environment. It's almost that case now with electronic communications and mailing lists and discussion boards. You know, uh, if you're interested in astronomy, you might follow all the NASA feeds in that. Uh, you can listen to the astronauts in the space station in real time. In the future, we can see all of these people working together, novices and experts alike, in the same environment on the same problems. And so our education becomes less and less about absorbing a certain kind of content and more and more about becoming a part of this community. And you'll be able to track your progress in education by your proximity to the core of this community. You begin as a novice, you're far away from the center, you don't know a lot, you do a lot of watching, you do a lot of, uh, you know, uh, imitating or attempting to replicate what other people have already done, but gradually, over time, you become more a part of the community. People start asking you questions, you start offering opinions, you begin to contribute you know, data, you contribute experimental results, you begin to contribute ideas, and then finally, as you become an expert, you're at the core of this community, and you begin to define the practice instead of just attempting to replicate the practice. You take the things that you've learned through your apprenticeship in this discipline, and you make it a part of the new definition of the discipline. So, the simple ideas, the simple things, power, connectivity, and being wherever you are, uh, leads to a very different model, a very different picture of education, but I think ultimately a much more inclusive form of education and a much more effective form of education. So I'm supposed to leave you with some questions and I won't ask you to guess where I am, <laughs> although it's tempting, and maybe one day there will be technology that would allow you to do that. But I'd like you to reflect how you can perform your work openly. Uh, I would ask you, first of all, do you do your work openly? Could you do your work openly? What would stop you? Uh, what would prevent you from working openly? Is there a reason why you could not share your teaching or your carpentry or whatever you do with the rest of the world? Is it a question of having the technology? Is it a question of having the money uh, for connectivity and power? Or is it a question of just not feeling confident in being able to do that? Are there political constraints that prevent you from sharing your work with the rest of the world? Once you've identified those constraints, if there are constraints, the next question I would ask you is, what does it take? What would it take 
for you to be able to work openly, for you to, when you do whatever work you do, when you do whatever hobbies you have, to share those with the world as you perform those tasks, as you create that bookshelf or that doghouse or whatever it is that you're working on. What would make it possible for you to work openly? And then finally, can you imagine what it would be like to be able to work with a community of other people who you're connected to as much as you want or as little as you want through the day that you can ask and you may respond to as much as you want? How would that change the way that you work? What sort of practices would you stop? What sort of new practices might you take up? Anyhow, that's my time. I hope you've enjoyed my video from the, the hills and valleys of Prince Edward Island here in Canada. It's been a pleasure talking to you and I certainly hope to be able to visit you one day in Argentina soon. Uh, in the meantime, gracias a uh, buenos dias. Arrivederci.